I am Peter Fischer, and um, I'm a Holocaust survivor. That means that the Germans were unable to kill me. And what I'm saying about the little Polish boy, a few years ago, I heard him telling me, he said, Peter, you brought me back to life. And we are famous now. We're never gonna go away. That's what he told me. <laughs> what was my father's crime? Being Jewish. That was his only crime. Holocaust Soliloquy is a joint production of Globalist Films and KLCS and is made possible with the generous support of Hillside Memorial Park and Mortuary, honoring the memories of the Southern California Jewish and interfaith families for over 75 years. And by Goji Farm USA, located in the heart of Sonoma County, California. This is Holocaust survivor Peter Fischel. Our cameras have been following him off and on since 1999. He was 68 years old when we started. Today, he's 87 and not doing well. My dreams. Holocaust survivors are dying every day, leaving fewer and fewer of them to offer the world a first-hand, in-person account of their experiences during World War II. Luck. Luck. This documentary will be available long after Peter Fischel leaves this earth. He's well aware that there is substantial audio-visual documentation of Nazi atrocities that will live forever. I can't hear you. But Peter Fischel's goal was to do more than record a video and put it on the internet. He wanted to educate young people, in the flesh, about the horrors of the Holocaust and look them in the eye and tell them about the extreme consequences that can come with bigotry, intolerance, and racism. His classroom calling card was surviving the greatest crime against humanity the world has ever seen. Peter Fischel was a so-called hidden child of the Holocaust, avoiding capture and death in Hungary during the tail end of World War II. About 600,000 of his fellow 900,000 Hungarian Jews, including his father, did not survive. The words who heard nothing. A soliloquy is the act of speaking one's thoughts aloud when by oneself, especially by a character in a play. Peter Fischel is not a fictional character, but he has made himself a solitary voice for more than two decades, trying in his own way to change the world. He hung right here. That's why his obsession since he retired in the 1990s from his print shop job has been characterized in this documentary as a Holocaust soliloquy. It all started for this former printer with this picture and a poem. He had duplicated and distributed the words of thousands of people as part of his profession, but never his own words. Then he wrote this poem, printed it on a poster under this iconic picture, and spent as much time as humanly possible trying to talk about it to anyone who would listen, especially young people. To the little Polish boy, standing with his arms up. I would like to be an artist so I could make a painting of you, little Polish boy. Standing with your little hat on your head. The Star of David on your coat. Standing in the ghetto with your arms up. As many Nazi machine guns pointing at you. I would make a monument of you and the world who said nothing. I would like to be a composer so I could write a concerto of you, 
little Polish boy. Standing with your little hat on your head, the Star of David on your coat. Standing in the ghetto with your arms up, as many Nazi machine guns pointing at you. I would write a concerto of you and the world who said nothing. I am not an artist, but my mind had painted a painting of you. 10 million miles high is the painting. So the whole universe can see you now, little Polish boy. Standing with your little hat on your head, the star of David on your coat. Standing in the ghetto with your arms up, as many Nazi machine guns pointing at you. And the world who said nothing. I'll make this painting so bright that it will blind the eyes of the world who saw nothing. Ten billion miles high will be the monument so the whole universe can remember of you, little Polish boy. Standing with your little hat on your head, the star of David on your coat, standing in the ghetto with your arms up, as many Nazi machine guns pointing at you. And the monument will tremble, so the blind world now will know what fear is in the darkness. The world who said nothing. I am not a composer, but I will write a composition for five trillion trumpets. So it will blast the eardrums of this world. The worlds who heard nothing. I am sorry that it was you and not me. I am sorry that it was you and not me. I am sorry that it was you and not me. You can use this poem in a poetry lesson, you can use this poem in a Holocaust lesson, you can use this poem in a history class, you can use this poem in an English class. I mean, it is very portable. You can use this poem in many different teaching situations. Nancy Gorell is a high school English teacher and was New Jersey's 1992 Teacher of the Year. Thousands of her fellow English teachers read an article Gorell wrote in the prestigious English Journal in which she explained to educators in detail how to get the most out of Peter Fischel's poem, both to refine their students' writing as well as their social conscience. I taught it to a number of different kinds of classes. I taught it to a number of different types of students. And I taught it to a, um, a number of different venues. I even taught it in um, a temple, um, I taught it to teachers at workshops for Holocaust, and as well as public school classrooms. After World War II, Peter Fischel stayed in Central Europe, in Hungary, which had become a client state of the Soviet Union. The communist oppression took its toll, so during the short-lived 1956 Hungarian Revolution, Fischel fled Hungary and eventually landed in Los Angeles. Years later, at a Hollywood newsstand, he saw this picture in Life magazine, showing a frightened boy in the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw, Poland. The little Polish boy was about the same age Fischl was during the Holocaust. The picture that was taken by a Nazi photographer as a gift for Adolf Hitler haunted Fischl. One night when he couldn't sleep, Peter Fischl hammered out the poem on an old manual typewriter and placed it in a desk drawer where it remained for years. Then, in retirement, in his 60s, he retrieved the poem and has used it to this day. Peter's poem is, is real. It's from his heart. It's from his experience. Um, no one can read that poem without being deeply moved by it. His poem is a real gift. It, it's, it's what poetry is really about. Um, it's his authentic voice. You almost, when you read the poem, you can, you can hear his voice. Um, you know, you can hear that there's sort of an accent to it, you know, a sort of a syntax to it that's his own. And, um, I mean, it's everything that I think as a poetry teacher I would want a poem to be. One of Peter Fischl's proudest moments was this display he created that was installed on the fourth floor of the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles.
The fourth floor of the Museum of Tolerance is a place of distinction. It is here that the Board of Trustees meets on a quarterly basis, where all of the school groups visit on their way to the cafeteria, a time to contemplate and reflect upon what they have seen in the museum and understand something about the world in which we live and our role of responsibility in it. And so we are pleased to place this installation amongst them with a special dedication and tribute in loving memory of your father and all of those who perished in the Holocaust and with recognition and tribute to your unrelenting passion, Peter, that has insisted that this story be told and retold and understood and remembered in the most poetic and visual way. Thank you. The Jews were a people and are a people who are committed to the idea of remembrance, but who are committed to remembrance not only of the good and of the wonderful and of the noble and of the terrific, but of the awful and the evil. And Peter, what you've done in enhancing this with your poetry, your own contribution, is to see it through the eyes of one who experienced that powerlessness, of one who experienced that victimization, and one who understands that the photograph is a plea for human decency and human dignity. And the survivor who gave voice to that photograph is an eloquent poet. Who is this boy? On the one hand, it doesn't really matter because that boy stands for a generation that was going to be wiped out. It stands for the attack on innocence by thugs and brutes with hatred in their heart. On the other hand, on a historical basis, it would be interesting to find out who this young boy was. I know of four cases in which identifications have been made. In two of them, the boy did not survive. In two others, he did. There is no picture that has been reproduced more about the Holocaust than this one. And yet, if one takes a look at the picture, there is no death. There will be. The fear is for the future, and I think that's one of the greatnesses of this particular icon. Having said that, I want to once again congratulate Mr. Fischel, who's made it now his life's work to commemorate the Holocaust, because let us face it, we are in a battle for memory today. There are those who 60 years after the Holocaust are not only ready to trivialize it, but some to forget it and others to deny it. With people like you, that will not happen. Peter Fischel's one-man campaign to educate young people got him recognized by the California Lottery for its Hero in Education initiative. Thanks, Pat. Thank Good you so much for here. Thank you. Tell us about tonight's hero. Well, tonight's hero is Peter Fischel. For the past eight years, Peter has volunteered his time speaking to students across California about peace, compassion, sensitivity, and tolerance. Peter is able to address these issues by drawing not only on his knowledge of history, but also on his own personal experience of dealing with prejudice, hatred, and oppression. You see, Peter is a Holocaust survivor. His father was killed by the Nazis when he was only 14 years old. Though the death of his father was a painful experience, it was this chilling black and white photograph of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising that forever changed his life. It inspired him to write the internationally famous poem entitled, To the Little Polish Boy Standing with His Arms Up, a poem which he is now able to use as a vehicle for talking about the Holocaust to California school kids. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Fischel. But Peter Fischel did not create the circumstances that led him to stand on a stage with actor Michael Gross in a Hollywood television studio. In fact, television was unknown to the world when Peter Fischel's life was changed forever in 1944. Before World War II, the Jews in Hungary's capital of Budapest made up nearly 25% of the population. They were prominent members of society, excelling in science, the arts, and business. Hungary had granted Jews equal citizenship status in 1867. 
But between 1938 and 1941, that changed as restrictive anti-Jewish laws were passed. Anti-Semitism and resentment spread across the region. Hungarian Jews were nearly 50% of the country's medical doctors, 41% of the veterinarians, 21% of the pharmacists, 34% of the journalists, nearly 25% of the musicians and actors, about 20% of the major landowners, and of the almost 3,000 factories in Hungary, more than 40% had a Jewish owner. Peter Fischel's father, Tibor, was no exception when it came to wealth and status. He was a rich businessman and was active in high society. To show his loyalty to his country, he had even served as a military officer during World War I. Peter Fischel and his sister Maria had a very good life before 1944. They commuted to their private school by chauffeured limousine, and they vacationed in Venice and Rome. I was unaware later on, I found out, that most of the people looked up at us because we looked different. We had a different lifestyle. I'd been horseback riding and we had race horses. And not everybody had horses and race horses and not everybody had a chauffeur driven car and things like that. And uh, later on I found out that People were bedazzled. They liked to come to my place because a uh, uh, second maid opened the door. She was, you know, in the usual outfit. And when they had uh, sandwiches or hot chocolate or tea that was served in a very elegant way on the silver plate and all that, that's what we had. That's what my mother brought in with her dowry and that was in the household and that was it. I didn't know that not everybody they had that. But looking back, that was not really what my father wanted. Because there was a time, and that was during the Nazi time, he said, I would give everything, whatever I have achieved in my life to live in a free country, <laughs> sitting on a curb <laughs> as a free human being and eating corn on the cob. <laughs> that is what remains from my father. In those days on the birth certificate, next to the name, it was religion. And according to the religion, I was I-Z-R. It's an abbreviation for Israelite, Zhido. Hungary essentially is a Roman Catholic country, always has been. Way before the Holocaust, there was a and anti-Semitism. It was just built in the nation an awareness about what that he is Jewish. It was mentioned it, it is Jewish. It would never mention if it was Kovács Laci or Szabó János, Római Katolikus vagy Református, namely next to their Hungarian, Aryan name, it would not be, ever be mentioned that they are Roman Catholic or Protestant. But when it was a Korn or a Grün or official, in our case, Zsidó, it was a giveaway. And it wasn't on the plus side. The Nazis rolled into Hungary in March 1944. By October, Peter, his sister, and his mother had fake identification papers and were in hiding. And this is where Tibor Fischl was hiding, a Budapest ambulance station. Through his many contacts, the wealthy businessman had gotten fake papers and a job as an ambulance driver. We had a tremendous amount of friends who were doctors. And in 1944, as a hiding place, the ambulance station looked like a terrific place 
to be because who would bother the ambulance station? My father must have talked to one of his contacts or several doctors who then took him in here as an ambulance driver. Many times when he had, we have to move from one hiding place to another, my father would come with the ambulance car and would take us through Nazi barricades because the Nazis wouldn't stop an, an ambulance car. He didn't want us to stick our heads up and out. We would be ducking. So from the outside, nobody could see in. So I understood that we have to be very low key and ready to disappear if it's needed. My father came on my birthday to visit me. I was 17. He came up with a Hungarian paramedic's car in his uniform. And that was the last time I have seen my father. Five days later, <laughs> Peter Fischel received a call from his father. Saying that he's calling me from the ambulance station and the Arrow Cross and I think Nazis were surrounding the station and they're taking him away. He doesn't know where. And he says to me, be good to your mother and sister. And then he went away and uh, I never heard from him or saw him ever in my life. This is the irreparable, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's impossible to deal with it. All the other details that we couldn't get eggs and butter on the market because the Jews were un, not allowed to go out and do the shopping when those things were available. Shucks, doesn't matter. As far as I'm concerned, the fact that, that I left my clothes behind and all, who cares? But my father, who was my life, I adored him. And we were very, very close. And then, gone. Today at the ambulance station, there's a permanent reminder of the Jewish men who hid there in 1944 and who did not survive to see the end of World War II. because we are at the Marko Cementerks where my father was hiding on his last days and was taken away November 27th and I never knew what happened to him. I like to say a few words in Jewish what I remember that Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Melecho Aulum. During that visit to Hungary in 2007, Peter Fischel visited the country's National Library, to which he donated a collection of his poem posters and a book he had written. He also spoke at the country's Holocaust Museum. We try, you know, 
to, to have lectures about this period uh, because this is a very uh, important thing in Hungary to, to not only to talk about the German responsibility but to talk about the Hungarian responsibility. And it it's totally shows that how from different laws and, uh, and different uh, prejudices uh, how these can lead to extermination of, of a certain group of people. Also in Budapest, Peter Fischel paid a visit to the biggest synagogue in Europe, where they've erected a memorial called the Tree of Life, built on the mass graves of Holocaust victims. Lonier Street, in an upscale section of Budapest, is where the officials lived before the Nazis occupied Hungary. When they first went into hiding, Fischl's father went to the ambulance station, his mother and sister sought refuge in a convent, and Peter was protected at a Catholic school. Because we had very quite often air raids. Before his trip to Hungary in 2007, he spoke in Los Angeles at an Anti-Defamation League educational conference at American Jewish University. His audience was a group of Catholic school teachers and administrators. My first hiding place was a Catholic school. Sixty Jewish kids were hiding in the Catholic school. These Catholic priests risked their lives for us. After the Catholic school and convent, Peter, his mother, and his sister moved to an apartment by the Danube River. We were hiding on the fifth floor, which today is Ben Rock Park 38. One day, the landlady came in and said uh, to my mother, Mrs. Fisher, as much as I regretted, but the Nazis are executing whole families with the families who hiding them. So you have to leave immediately, I mean tomorrow morning. So then we packed together and next morning we started walking and we went through the Danube River and walked all the way to Chaletrom Utsa. The last place the three remaining members of the Fischl family hid was on Shalatram Utsa, or Shalatram Street in Budapest. There was a new house we had to go in and establish ourselves so the people won't be suspicious that we are Jews hiding because we had phony papers we bought. My name was Peter Berkey, not Fischl. So there was a small scare as maybe we will be discovered. The people who lived here kind of cornered me and threw 100 questions a minute towards me as where we came from and blah, 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 blah. The Russian army's heavy weapons were very closely heard from here. So these people had to think if they're gonna call the Gestapo out and put us away, maybe within two days they're gonna be taken away as war criminals. And I think that's why we survived. Otherwise, I think we would have died. We had to bring our beds and furniture down here to survive because the bombings were so heavy. You couldn't live in your apartment and survive. So here is, these stairs take you down what we call our bunker. This was our living space. 
my sister and my bed was somewhere around here. I don't exactly know where it was, but this wasn't here, so that's where we slept. I could never forget it. I have to live with all these horrors what happened. I have to live, and this is what nobody can escape. In 2007, as Peter Fischel stepped back onto the public sidewalk in front of that final 1945 hiding place, he saw a construction site for a new metro stop. He struck up a conversation with a security guard there and stumbled across some disturbing information. Megközelítőleg egy markológép, másfél két hete kiemelt a földre 8-10 csontváz fejet, tehát fejet, csontvázat, jól mondom, a fejet, koponyát, és utána a csontokat, tehát a hozzávaló csontokat találtuk meg. Hát valószínű, hogy vagy 1945-ös hullák, vagy 1956-osak. Kettő lehetett, hát ezt csak így tömegsírt találtunk, uram. So for more than two decades, Peter Fischel has looked thousands of American school children in the eye at middle schools and high schools and tried to leave them with a little more compassion for their fellow man. Humanity, he says, is the only thing that will save the human race. It's actually my sister's yellow star. She saved this. I don't know where my yellow star is, and I don't really miss it. The word is discrimination. Can we tr uh, write that term down, discrimination? Okay, this would be acting on one's prejudice. When the Germans came in, I was on the street, and I actually saw the Germans marching in. <coughs> and I ran home and I told my father, I said, Dad, the Germans just came in. I saw them on the street. Do you think it's possible that all of us are going to be killed now? And he looked in my eyes and he said, yes. So that wasn't too good a feeling for a young kid, but it was true. Marvin Heyer is consistently listed in Newsweek magazine as one of America's most influential rabbis. In 2007 and 2008, he was number one. He's seen here in Los Angeles at the Simon Wiesenthal Center's observance of Holocaust Remembrance Day on April 19, 2004. Most recently, you might have seen Rabbi Heyer deliver a prayer at President Donald Trump's inauguration on January 20, 2017. Bless President Donald J. Trump and America, our great nation. And just look at our world. We live in a world where Ahmadinejad says that the Holocaust, what Peter is talking about, is a lie. It's a myth. It never happened. That Peter's father, who called him on the telephone and said, they're coming for me, and that and they never saw his father again. According to Ahmadinejad, this was all invented. And therefore, when a survivor does that, they ensure the continuity of human civilization based on tolerance. And that's why uh, the work of Peter and the survivor generation is so important to keep alive that message. It can happen again. If you don't want it to happen again, you yourself have to vow not to be a bystander. There were too many people in the bleachers during World War II. We need people to take box seats to what is happening on their watch in their world. At a Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles in 2007, Peter Fischel was invited to light a candle. Mr. Peter Fischel was one of the hidden children of the Holocaust. The guest speaker at the event was historian and author Deborah Lipstadt, who was accused of libel in England by Holocaust denier David Irving. Her book on the trial was made into a movie in 2016.
At one point during the trial, when I walked into the courtroom, a woman handed me a list, a list of names, uh, all with the same last names, next to them a date of birth, and in certain cases, a date of death. Uh, in certain cases, just a question mark. It clearly was her family who had been um, who had been destroyed. And when someone hands you a list like that, you don't just glance it over it. You you read each name, um, but there are no words to say. And I tried to telegraph my empathy, my concerns, my sadness, and I just and then I gave her back in, in my body language. And I gave her back the list, and she got very angry, and she said, "No." This is my evidence. This is my evidence. You must take it into the courtroom with you. <laughs> Peter Fischel's unrelenting effort to be a voice for Holocaust education has given him a certain level of celebrity. It got him invited to a bar mitzvah in San Bernardino County, a candlelight vigil for Darfur in Arizona, and this girl from Orange County was so inspired by Fischel's poem, she invited him to watch her school presentation on the little Polish boy in costume. I would like to be an artist so I can make a painting of you, little Polish boy. Standing with your, with your little hat on your head, the Star of David on your coat. Standing in the ghetto with your arms up as many Nazi machine guns pointed at you. The only reason bad things can happen if people turn their head and don't say a word. We're all here because our eyes have been opened to the horrors of genocide. We must speak up now for those who don't have voices and do something to put an end to this genocide. Our final speaker, he's a survivor of the Holocaust. It's another genocide that's very well known and we said never again and of course we've seen several since. His name is Peter Fischel. I wrote a poem about a world of human beings who ignored a Holocaust of six million people and unfortunately, the poem is all too appropriate for what has since happened in Cambodia, in Rwanda, in Kosovo, or as is the case today in Darfur. Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu B'mitvota Vitibanu, Vahitate Basiti. Amen. Ahava Raba Ahavtanu, Adonai Eloheinu, Chem Lagidola Vitera, Chamalta Aleinu. Born in Hungary, Peter Fischel was already bar mitzvahed before the war started. But because of what he endured during the Holocaust, I believe that his story had to be spread to our congregation, community, and all of my friends and family attending my bar mitzvah. <laughs> In Chino Hills, Peter Fischel was the guest of honor at the Ayala High School Drama Club's performance of Playing for Time. The play, which years ago was a television movie, is based on the autobiography The Musicians of Auschwitz, which tells the story of survival in the death camp by imprisoned Jewish orchestra members, allowed to live so they can entertain their captors. During the play, my mind didn't stop for a second because it brought up all my memories from the Holocaust. You speak when asked, otherwise, silence! And it's 
very, very hard to describe or express as what was really going on. It never should happen again. Not just necessarily with the Jews. I don't know. I can't see the future. But this world is not 100% balanced. So we cannot tell as what's going to happen the next minute. And in 10 seconds, the world can change. And we are living proof of that because in 10 seconds, it happened with us when the Germans moved in to Hungary. Off, oh, off, oh, everybody, come on. This is what Auschwitz looked like in Chino Hills. This is what it looked like when Peter Fischel visited Poland in June 2007. As we know, he avoided capture and death camps, but Auschwitz is where tens of thousands of Fischl's fellow Hungarian Jews perished. Fischl also went to Auschwitz to try to come to terms with the feelings he had for the boy in that picture, who reminded him of himself in 1944. It's very highly likely that this is where uh, the little Polish boy ended up after he was captured in Warsaw in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Well, it's devastating to see this unbelievable slaughter was going on like a slaughterhouse. Also, I got a new view and understanding of this big German SS army. Basically, what a coward people they were. They had old men and women and children and very few people who would have been able to fight or attack anybody. And they have double electric wires surrounding this place. In every few hundred meters, they have a machine gun tower. That tell me that if you want to find somebody who's a real coward, you, you have to look for an SS or a German. Rudolf Hoss was the longest serving commandant at the Auschwitz Killing Center. He streamlined the murder process by introducing the pesticide Zyklon B, increasing the kill rate to thousands of innocent lives per day, eventually reaching a final tally of 2.5 million. After the war, Hoss was captured, put on trial, and sentenced to death. He was hanged at Auschwitz, outside the entrance to the gas chambers. Hoss was the man who ran this unbelievable camp for Jews. The Jews were tortured, worked to death, and put into the gas chamber. Hoss, after the war, was tried as a war criminal, and he hung right here. And Right there. I'm very glad I came to Auschwitz because it's no way that anybody really will know as what happened here without coming here and inhaling this building, this event.
By the summer of 2015, health issues were slowing down 85-year-old Peter Fischel, but he simply couldn't pass up a visit to a most improbable place, the International Quilt Study Center and Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. Equally improbable, the story behind Peter Fischel's donation of a quilt to the museum. It started two decades earlier, when fifth grade students from Corpus Christi, Texas, read Fischel's poem and then wrote their own Holocaust poetry. The best poems were made part of a quilt which was mailed to Fischel. Katie Wiesen was an 11-year-old Texan when her poem was among those chosen for the quilt. All the children in the fifth grade took part in writing poems and drawing pictures to represent what we had learned from Fischel's poem. We were told some of our poems and art would be selected to be placed on a special quilt that we would send to Peter himself. When I was contacted by Peter Fischel about this quilt 15 years later, I instantly remembered this moment as it had impacted my life greatly. As ironic as it may sound, I believe the events that brought us to know one another are like a quilt. Each of our stories are completely unique, similar to an intricate piece of patchwork yet woven together as if they were meant to end up on the same piece of fabric. What is fabulous about quilts? Our quilts tell stories. Quilts are commemorative. You get them for births, weddings, graduations, um, special events. Quilts have always been vehicles for political speech. Quilts are our voice, and that is what this quilt is. It is significant in its historical value, in the stories that it tells, the way in which it came about. We are an international quilt museum, and this quilt tells an international story. And, and I hope that he realizes that his quilt's going to live on forever here at the museum, and his message is going to live on forever as well. And that's really what I wanted to, for today to be about, and I'm hoping that that's what Peter felt as well. An individual like Peter Fischel who lived an experience and, and lived a, and, and suffered and struggled and, and rose above all of what he went through, through the Holocaust, through the Hungarian Revolt, and found a way to bring that information to individuals in a, in a loving way, in a, in a way that students who are fifth graders, 11 year olds, could really grasp the idea of what that quote was about. And to have um, students who are so young express themselves in a quilt in what is a very traditional way because we have a collection in our, or we have quilts in our museum from the Civil War where people express their sentiments on quilts. Now we have fifth graders from Corpus Christi, Texas doing the same thing in 1999. So there's a thread of continuity among it that, that or between them that's really striking, but yet it brings a whole new audience into our world and a whole new group of individuals into our world. So it's a very unique quilt in a lot of ways. In April 2017, just a few months away from his 87th birthday, Peter Fischel was healthy enough to travel to what turned out to be his last speaking engagement of the year. It was in San Bernardino County at Quail Valley Middle School. Today we have the special privilege of having Peter Fischel here with us today. <laughs> Peter Fischel, as you all know, his, his, a bit of his background, has been speaking with students for over 30 years. He estimates that he's spoken to over 100 different schools over the years. And today we have the privilege and the honor to hear him tell of his experience during the time of World War II and the time of the Holocaust and to talk a little bit about his experience in writing his poem. The most of the things that the Nazis done to us wasn't so much as when it happened, but it was horrible when we thought about it years later like years later, I still had dreams of my father because he was taken away from me and killed by the Nazis. On July 19, 2017, Peter Fischel turned 87. 
He had survived two heart attacks, colon and prostate cancer, and of course, the Holocaust. On January 28, 2018, this documentary was completed, and Peter Fischel watched it from his bed while fading in and out of consciousness. Two weeks later, like so many other aging Holocaust survivors do every day, Peter Fischel died. I, for the last 30 years, been going to schools, not charging most of the schools a penny, and teaching the horrors of the Holocaust. And I have to fight to be heard. They don't come with open arms and say, oh, Mr. Fisher, how generous and beautiful of you that you're offering us to come to our school. I don't give up. I am not the person who gives up. There's no way on this universe. I believe if you go out on a beach and you pick up a sand particle and you move it, you changed history. And I think I am that sand particle and I'm doing it. I don't, it doesn't bother me as how great it is. This is the best I can do. The Star of David on your coast. Holocaust Soliloquy was a joint production of Globalist Films and KLCS and was made possible with the generous support of Hillside Memorial Park and Mortuary, honoring the memories of the Southern California Jewish and interfaith families for over 75 years. And by Goji Farm USA, located in the heart of Sonoma County, California. <laughs>